Good morning to every one of you. Shall we just pray? Yeah. Oh, our dear God and gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning. Thank you that we can wake up and uh, make our way here to this, uh, this room, this place, Lord. And this place is, even though it may just be a building yet, Lord, uh, we thank you that your Holy Spirit is, in, is abiding with us. And we thank you for this reminder that each time, Lord, when we mention your name, when we are together, together, Lord, you are right in our midst. We thank you. And today, Lord, we are, serve, we are serving a, a risen Savior. He's no more in the grave. He's right up in heaven, seated next to the Father, uh, and looking down at us, and not only looking and watching over every child that is yours, Lord. Uh, yeah, we can truly rest in you and we can have this great peace knowing that you watch us over us. You never slumber nor sleep. You never uh, leave us alone. So bless our time, Lord, even as we uh, spend a short time uh, uh, reminding ourselves of your great love before we take this communion. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Yeah, this morning, uh, just uh, before we take the communion, I just want to uh, remind us again of the first Passover uh, story uh, in Exodus chapter 12. A classic model of deliverance from bondage uh, is the story of the Israelites' deliverance from bondage by their Egyptian masters. And uh, I'd like to read just a very... Uh, short passage from this uh, Exodus chapter 12, which Moses uh, read, uh, mentioned. Can uh, Bill uh, please? It's from Exodus chapter 12, verses 12 to 14. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn both men and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Before the Israelites were able to come out from Egypt, ten plagues, each more severe and punishing than before, had to be laid on Egypt before the Pharaoh of the day let the Israelites go. It was the tenth plague that necessitated the killing of a clean, healthy lamb. As on the right day, on that, pen, on that day, uh, the angel of death, the destroyer, passes every household and dwellings in Egypt. As it passes, it looked for a blood-stained covering over its doorposts. When the angel of death saw the blood, it passes over that dwelling, sparing the life of the firstborn who lived in that house. Exodus chapter 12, verse 22. This is the Old Testament's act of God's salvation plan. In this and through this, God taught his people a vital principle. God saves by substitution. He saved these people because animals were sacrificed in their place. 
As Moses records that night in Egypt, there was not a house where someone was not dead. Exodus chapter 12 verse 30. A son had died or a lamb had to die. God's people deserved death for their sins. But because they obeyed and trusted in the sacrifice of another substitute, as God had commanded and that God had provided, they were spared and delivered. Every year throughout Old Testament history, God's people looked back to this event and remembered that great truth. God saves by substitution. All those years and all those feasts underline the significance of the moment when as John the Baptist in the New Testament saw Jesus walking towards him. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John chapter 1 verse 29. Here was someone who was God's provision to save his people from sin, to set his people free, just like the Passover lamb did. <coughs> Israel's exodus is a foreshadowing of mankind's great exodus. When men or women deserving God's judgment trust in the blood, that was shed on their behalf on the cross, they find freedom from sin. Every shackle is broken, just as the Israelites' chains were shed when they were set free from slavery. As we take communion, think of this story. We take the communion because Jesus is our sacrifice. Is the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb. He is your and He is my substitute. We have no judgment to fear, for it lies behind you, paid and dealt with at the cross. If you have understood, believed with all your heart, and it's very clear that Jesus is your substitute, He has died to save you. He has died to clean your sins. Then, join me to take the emblems of the Passover, the bread and the juice. In your own time, just take the bread first, uh, the, the wafer, uh, and then later we'll uh, drink together as unity of one in the body of Christ. Shall we pray before we take the juice? Our dear, gracious, merciful, and loving Heavenly Father, we love you because you first loved us. We are totally helpless when it comes to things of your kingdom. You are righteous, you are holy, just, mighty, and wise. Thank you for your salvation plan so freely extended to anyone who will call on you and accept your precious gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. As we take these Jews, we take with thankful and grateful hearts, remembering that you went to the cross 2,000 over years ago to be our sacrificial lamb. Your life-saving blood cleanses our sins and made us right with you. 
We also claim your promises that whenever we eat these Passover elements, the bread and the juice, we proclaim your death until you come back again. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's drink together. We shall now give thanks for the offering. Again, Father, we leave this offering and types to you. We thank you for the giving of our, from our members here. We know, Lord, you own everything and give us all we need for our living. Everything we need, you have provided. May these gifts be acceptable to you. May it be well put to further your kingdom's work. We also pray for every member of this church who may be of poor health. Lord, grant your strength and healing and sustenance to everyone who needs it. Bless every ministry that runs here and its leaders and helpers and carers. For anyone whom you draw to save, May this church be a light and shelter to them. Bless every family represented here, Father, particularly our youths, our children, and infants. We ask your loving hand will lead and guide their young life and bless them in their growth and maturity. We thank you in Jesus' worthy name. Amen. morning everybody great to see you all here today a special welcome if it's your first time here today I just want to bring your attention to the fact that we're at the end of May which means that this coming Friday um, which happens on the first Friday of every month is our fasting and prayer together and that's held online um, start fasting from 3.30 in the afternoon and then jump online at 7 o'clock where you can join with other people and uh, pray together in community and a really uh, exceptional and wonderful time to do that. So look out for an email this week um, with more details on that. Before we get to our message from Robin this morning, um, we have a special guest that I just want to welcome up now. It's Andrew Miller from DMI, and he's going to give us an update on all of the happenings from DMI. So please join me and uh, welcome Andrew this morning. Good morning, church. It's wonderful to be back here to see many of you again and to share a little bit of what DMI has been doing over the last uh, few months or since the last time that I spoke with you. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, this was taken last November, just a young boy in Burundi. Uh, he's deaf, and I just want to explain for those who, who don't know that much about DMI why we do what we do. The deaf in developing countries receive very little, if anything, from their governments. No education, no employment prospects, certainly no community or gospel teaching. And so they're often left um, neglected, uh, just shut away at home, uh, unable to communicate, um, typically growing up to in very menial labour, uh, begging, sometimes prostitution. Many of them don't even know their own name. And we're working to change all of that. Let's go to the next slide. Our main mission. Our mission is to take the gospel and education and employment of the deaf all around the world, especially in developing countries, which you can see the red pins are the, the countries that we are serving in, the recipient countries, and the green pins are the supporting countries, Australia being, being one of those. Let's go to the next slide. DMI, uh, probably most of you know, but for those who are new, DMI was founded by Neville and Lil Muir. Lil and Ian are here this morning. It's great to have them uh, here and joining us. And I also want to share with you that earlier this year, Neville was posthumously awarded the Order of Australia for his services to the deaf. And that's a, a really deserved award and it reflects wonderfully on Neville. It reflects well on the Muir family and it reflects well on DMI too. So we're really encouraged and thankful for that. Let's have a quick look at DMI by the numbers. We're currently operating in 21 countries. We have uh, developed or heavily invested in, in 10 schools, educating around 700 students. 
We have around 70 employment projects currently operating. We employ around 100 staff in the fields, nearly all of whom are deaf. And most importantly, we have founded 180 churches for the deaf across these countries, serving about 5,000 deaf every week. It's a wonderful thing that we're doing. And uh, it's known fairly well here in this church and others, but out in the community, so few know about us. And we're working very hard to change that because it's such a wonderful ministry, doing so much good, just working hard to get the word out there. Let's have a look at the next slide. Okay, education very quickly, and we'll go on to the next slide. This was taken uh, in, in a new school that we've begun to move into in Burundi. Burundi, remember, is the poorest country in the world. So what we're able to do here is, is really groundbreaking for a lot of the deaf. Uh, and it's not just giving the kids a chance to go to school. Okay, what we're giving them is we're teaching them how to communicate, how to learn, how to find and, and, and develop community, which is so important for the deaf, to have community, uh, to learn the skills, to have meaningful employment, and most of all, to give them an opportunity to hear the gospel of Christ. And let's have a look at the next slide. Uh, stay on that slide, but the one before, by the way, uh, we're working, we found at that school, it's not our school, but we're moving into that to help support. There are 10 deaf blind students there who are not receiving that special education that they need, and they're the 10 that we're focusing on at that school. This one here is our school in Calais in, in Myanmar, and this is just an example of how we incorporate uh, the gospel and Christian teaching in the education program. This is morning devotions, and Saw Monday in the red there on the right is our leader with his wife, and I think we can play this video, and you can see how they have their morning devotions. Have we got some sound with that? That's good. That's all you'll hear, but there's more sound to come. I asked one of the students there, what's your favorite subject? And she said, oh, it's morning devotions. So they love doing this every morning. Okay, thanks. Let's go to the next one. Okay, let's quickly look at employment. Uh, next slide. Um, we have two means of of developing or uh, building employment uh, amongst the deaf and developing countries. One is through a microloan program. The other is through a community grant program. This one here is in Rwanda. Uh, again, that we were there last November. And this is a training uh, program for the deaf connected to the church or the, church, the, the deaf community in Kigali. And each of them are getting together to, to learn. This is an outside professional um, employment educator teaching the deaf how to, how to choose a business, how to run a business, how to make it sustainable. And, uh, and they've just started these just in the last couple of months. And they're really interesting. Some of them are building, developing uh, farming uh, businesses. Some are setting up little shops. They're fairly, fairly typical. But others are, one's setting up a popcorn store, uh, one's setting up a billiard parlor. And that guy with the billiard parlor, he started running. It's already making a profit. And last month, like this month, he donated $2 back to DMI just to say thank you for, for, for that. Um, so that, lots going on there um, in the microloan program. Let's go to the next slide. Here's another one. Uh, again, in Burundi, we have a number, about 10 or 12 different sewing workshops for the deaf, mainly the deaf ladies, uh, who would otherwise never have employment. And they, these ladies are not only uh, providing, you know, an in, getting an income for themselves, but they're also... Uh, feeding their income back towards the community. Uh, earlier this year, the ladies from these combined uh, sewing workshops got together and they paid $300 back into the deaf community. Now in Burundi, that's a lot of money. So they're not just earning money for themselves, they're really supporting the whole deaf community. It's wonderful to see this self-sustainability coming into the programs. Let's go to the next one. This is Matthias, who co-leads DMI with me. Matthias is deaf and based in Oslo, Norway. And we were inspecting fields, five fields that we just rented in Burundi as part of the community grant program. And the community grant program looks to um, serve four purposes. The first is uh, to meet an immediate need. It might be to feed a community, to clothe a community, to transport a community, something like that. It's to educate the deaf who are involved in the program. It's to employ the deaf who are involved in the program, and it's to bring an income into the community. Um, and those fields are going really well. Let's have a look at the next slide, because you can see uh, in April, 
uh, we began to harvest the fields and uh, the harvest was better than we expected so we actually had to very hastily build that storage shed as well to keep all the, all the harvest in. So uh, that's in Burundi. Let's go to the next one. And let's talk about the gospel. Next slide, please, because this is really at the heart of what we're doing here. And this is unique amongst deaf ministry. We are training the deaf to take the gospel to the deaf. It's not hearing people doing it. We train the deaf to take the gospel to the deaf. This is in, in um, Kampala, our church, the Makareda Church in Kampala, Uganda. And the deaf are hearing the gospel often for the first time, in their own native sign language. Sign languages are different all over the world, every country, and each regions have different sign languages. So they're hearing the gospel, often for the first time, in their own sign language. Next one, please. This means that we're having, we, we baptize a lot of people. In the last three months, we would have baptized about 30 new deaf believers. Uh, let's keep going. Uh, not only that, we, we see them through not just into salvation, but maturing in faith through a number of Bible studies, discipleship programs. We've started to develop what we call or use what we call the Father Heart programs, from a European program, for the deaf to understand the Father's love for them and what that means and how that impacts their life. Thanks. Um, I want to finish uh, by sharing you Sylvia's story because Sylvia's story is extraordinary. It's at the same time common in, in the world, in DMI's world. And it illustrates very much the work that we're doing. Now, Sylvia uh, is in, I met her in Kampala. She was born deaf. She was orphaned at the age of three. She was taken in by her grandmother, who was an alcoholic, and beat her every night. Sylvia used to hide out on the streets until late at night when she thought her grandmother was asleep and it would be safe to come home. Sometimes it was, sometimes it wasn't. Uh, the things that happened to Sylvia when she was telling me, uh, I was using an interpreter, her groans were so loud, I couldn't hear everything the interpreter was saying and I really didn't want to hear everything the interpreter was saying. She had a really, really miserable, fearful upbringing. Uh, she ran away. Uh, at the age of nine when she heard that she had relatives in Kampala. She came and lived with the relatives who at least didn't abuse her, but they fed her and they gave her a place to sleep, but they said to her, everything you eat, you're going to have to pay us back. Okay, this is a 10-year-old deaf girl. Around that time, she met another deaf girl who said to her, why don't you come to school? That's similar to saying, hey, why don't we go to the moon? Okay, for her, there's just no chance for a deaf, poor girl to get any kind of schooling. But this girl said to her, oh, I'm sponsored by DMI. Um, maybe we can get DMI to sponsor you too. Long story short, we were able to sponsor Sylvia. She completed her schooling. We'll go to the next slide. We also helped Sylvia get an internship at a signing cafe in Kampala. And we visited there. She made the best chocolate milkshake I've ever had. It was really good. And not only has Sylvia done well in the internship, but if we go to the next slide, Sylvia is now the manager of the coffee shop. So she's doing really well. But it's more than that. Yes, we educate and yes, we, we work to give employment. But we aim to see lives changed by the gospel of Christ, today's Pentecost, and seeing the Holy Spirit move and change the lives of these people is amazing. Now, I want to share with you, Sylvia is also the worship leader at the church in Kampala. And I've seen a lot of gifted worship leaders, but I've never seen anyone like Sylvia. And you've got to see it to believe it, which is why I have a very short video to show you. And I want you to look at this. Don't play it yet for a second, please. Sylvia's the one out the front. I want you to look at the, the humble exuberance that she shows when she leads, firstly towards encouraging the other, others on the worship team and then turning to the congregation and encouraging them. And you'll see her signing joy like this and the power of God. So let's have a look at this, about 30 seconds, and watch how Sylvia leads worship.
That is a young girl who was a young girl whose life was characterized by fear, despair, and hopelessness. And you can see now her life is rich. She has, she's educated. She has a job. And she is filled with the Holy Spirit to lead worship like that. And she, that demonstrates. There are lots of stories that I could share with you similar to that. Extraordinary, but common in DMI. I do have to add one thing. Sylvia has given me permission to share her story. Uh, but I, when I do, I, she asked me to tell you that she is single and she's looking for marriage. So if there are any single guys there, just chat with me after the service. Maybe we can connect something up there. Um, let me finish with this. If, if, how can you help DMI? I want to say you already are. Monash Church is a great supporting church, and, and because of your generosity, we're able to, to do this work. So I really want to thank you for that. If you're not already contributing individually and you'd like to, there are three ways that you can do that. One is through prayer. It's not a token thing. We have a prayer sign-up sheet out the front, and we will send you an email every week of points that need prayer. That's the foundation of our ministry. You can help with finance. You can sponsor a child or a project or give generally. That would be wonderful too. And service as well. We need help. We need volunteers. We need representatives locally, nationally, internationally. There's lots of work to be done. So if the Holy Spirit is nudging you, don't resist. Okay, Resistance is futile, uh, as I've learned. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you again for your support. Um, and please continue to support us. Thanks very much. Good morning, church. Uh, today's reading is taken from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. May God bless the reading of his word. Thanks, uh, Angeline. Good morning. It's great to be here to uh, share with you again. And thanks, Andrew, for... Uh, sharing with us with, in, in terms of what God's doing through DMI, and it's a real privilege for us to be able to partner uh, with DMI. When it comes to mission, it's, it's often said that three categories of people in churches, zealous senders, zealous goers, and the disobedient. So it's great for us to partner with DMI and have a part in uh, the harvest that is being reaped. Today we uh, conclude our teaching series Onward, where we have been learning what it means to follow Jesus as his disciples. For not all who follow Jesus are his disciples, and not all who claim to be his disciples are his true disciples. We have learned that being a true disciple of Christ requires us to pursue God above all else, to pursue holiness, obedience, and our calling at all cost. We learned that when God calls us to follow him, he will provide for our spiritual and material needs in miraculous ways. We are to take courage and have faith. For in this world, we will have trouble. But we are called to make disciples in the knowledge that Jesus himself is leading us and he will never leave nor forsake us. Today we focus our attention on the ultimate purpose of discipleship, the goal of discipleship. Why do we follow Jesus? Why are we called to be his true disciples? That goal, the ultimate purpose of discipleship is Christ himself, on whom we are called to fix our gaze so that we might be found to be disciples who become more like Christ. We are called to persevere in our walk with the Lord so that the darkness of our sinful nature may be diminished by the light of his divine nature. 
As John the Baptist declared in John 3.30, he must become greater, I must become less. And this is the mindset that we are called to have as disciples of Christ, for it is only then when the world sees us that they will see Christ in us. Before we begin a quick poll, how many of us feel like we have reached peak Christ-likeness? No one? Elders? No? I thought it was a prerequisite for being an elder. No. <laughs> I think we can all agree that there is room for each of us to grow when it comes to becoming more like Christ. And Hebrews 12 verses 1 to 3 is an encouragement to each of us. As we look at this passage in Hebrews, it is useful for us to be aware that the writer of the book of Hebrews is not known. And that's a good prompt for us to be reminded that even though we might not know the human writer of the book of Hebrews, we can be reminded that all of scripture is God-breathed. 2 Timothy chapter 3 reminds us of this, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be equipped, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so I repeat my encouragement, exhortation, even from week one of our series. Find your Bible, pick it up, read it, understand it, and live by it. 25 minutes a day is all it takes to read through the entire Bible in six months. The word of the God, word of God is the sword of the spirit. Equip yourself thoroughly for what God is calling you to do. George Muller, the British missionary, preached the gospel to more than three million people in 42 countries. He read through his Bible more than a hundred times. He was thoroughly equipped. We might not know the writer of the book of Hebrews, but the book of Hebrews was written to people just like us. Followers of, followers of Jesus who were at risk of falling away. And so its message is as relevant today as it was back then. This passage in Hebrews is both a note of encouragement to us and a note of instruction to everyone that seeks to be a true disciple of Christ. And the writer seeks to motivate us to stay the course by revealing to us, if you like, three keys or secrets of true discipleship. The first one is faith is the mark of a true disciple. Without faith, you cannot be a true disciple of Christ. Hebrews 12 begins with the words, therefore, and when, whenever we come across this in scripture, we know that the statement that is following is motivated by the passages before it. And that motivating text for us is actually from the middle of Hebrews chapter 10, from verse 19 in Hebrews chapter 10, all the way through to the end of Hebrews chapter 11. We are reminded in Hebrews 10 verses 19 to 22 that it is by faith that we can draw near to God with the full assurance that the blood of Christ has cleansed us from not just our sin, but also our guilt. Our sin has been both forgiven and forgotten. We are also warned in Hebrews 10 that a fearful judgment awaits both those that have outright rejected the sacrifice of Christ and those that have received the knowledge of the truth but deliberately keep sinning. We are also reminded in Hebrews 10, 23 to 24, we are called as disciples to spur each other on towards love and good deeds, and even more so as the day of the Lord's coming nears, so that we might be found as worthy servants when Jesus returns, for he will not come as a helpless babe, he will come as a righteous judge to judge the living and the dead. Hebrews 10, 32 to 35 is a reminder that if we choose to serve Christ, we will face hardship and persecution. And in fact, it's my personal conviction that the higher the calling for the cause of Christ, the greater hardship and persecution 
that you will face. And there is no greater calling on a disciple of Christ than a missional calling. Being a missionary is the highest calling that one can receive in the body of Christ, for it requires the greatest of sacrifices. And it is not everyone's calling. And no, not everyone is a missionary. For the work of missions is the backbreaking, groundbreaking work of taking the gospel to the unreached peoples of the world that have no Christians living among them or a church among them that is strong enough to reach them with the gospel. It is not an easy task. Hebrews 10 calls us to persevere in our times of hardship and persecution with the assurance of the Lord's return and the promise of glory. And all of this is summed up, if you like, in our definition of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Faith is confidence in the finished work of Christ and assurance that he will return. And it is, it is these two markers of our faith that are to motivate us in our walk. It is these two markers that motivate us to run our race victoriously, for we draw our confidence from the cross, the finished work of Christ, who is our living hope, and we draw our assurance from the certainty of Christ's return. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Who is this great cloud of witnesses? Hebrews chapter 11 gives us that list. We come across in Hebrews chapter 11 a list of both Old Testament and New Testament heroes, if you like, that all had one thing in common faith. Their lives were marked by acts of obedience, righteousness, courage, and justice that was made possible by their deep deep confidence in God and his promises. Because of their faith, we are told they pleased God and became heirs of righteousness. An intimidating list may be Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel. And then there is Daniel whose faith shut the mouths of lions. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego whose faith quenched the fiery flames. And then there were the others. Stephen, who was stoned for the cause of Christ. The apostle Simon, who was sawn in two. For his faith. The Apostle Paul, who was imprisoned and chained, their faith remained steadfast. Rather than intimidate us, these heroes of the faith have shown us what is possible and should motivate us. This is the great cloud of witnesses that is not looking over us to judge us, but is looking over us to cheer us on, to tell us, we did it, and so can you. They may not have all been perfect, but their faith in God was unwavering. So by faith, we are called to run the race marked out for us, motivated by our confidence in the sacrifice of Christ and the assurance of his return, and encouraged by the saints that have gone before us. And we are called to run, not stroll, walk, or jog even. No run, implying purpose, intent, focus, energy, passion, excitement, gumption. Run, why? Because, of the, because the day of the Lord's coming is near. And it is his desire that none should perish. 
run how? By doing three things. We are called to run our race with one, perseverance. Two, by removing any hindrance. And three, by not being entangled in sin. As we were reminded at the start of our series, true discipleship requires us to pursue God above all else. It also requires us to pursue holiness without any compromise. Anything that in hinders our wholehearted pursuit of God and his cause needs to be removed from our lives. We are to pursue holiness seeking to live by God's standards and his word rather than be driven by our own selfish desires and will. And sometimes we try to convince ourselves that we can get as close to the line as possible and we'll be okay as long as we don't cross the line. The line here being something that we know is not pleasing to God. Perhaps it is that TV show or movie that is all the craze or that outfit that is in fashion or perhaps that crude joke that will endear us to our work colleagues. Discipleship is not about seeing how close as possible to that line we can get without crossing it. And we are reminded of the folly of such thinking in Proverbs chapter 6, 27 to 28. Can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? No, it's not about seeing how close to the line we can get. No, it's, it's instead about fleeing from sin and pursuing righteousness, as the Apostle Paul charged young Timothy. 2 Timothy 2.22, a, a, a verse, a reference very easy to remember with all the twos in them. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Flee, take flight, head in the opposite direction, for you are to flee from evil to pursue righteousness. Our discipleship is not an intellectual exercise though. It is something that we are called to live out. And this side of heaven, there will be times when we will face temptation, trials and tribulations even. We will be tested, there will be trouble and therefore perseverance is required if we are to finish our race victoriously. When we think of perseverance, we sometimes tend to equate it with practice. But scripture tells us that when it comes to discipleship, it is not practice that produces perseverance, rather it is the testing of our faith that produces perseverance. James chapter one, verses two to four. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And we can be sure of this, if we faithfully run the race that is marked out for us, then our faith will be tested. And when we are tested, we are called to consider it pure joy. Does not seem very logical. But why are we called to consider it pure joy? Because the testing of our faith produces perseverance, which is what will enable us to run our race, to finish our race victoriously. Joy in times of testing seems almost an impossible equation. But it's possible because joy is the product of faith. Our happiness is dictated by our happenings. It's dictated by our circumstances. But joy is the unexplainable supernatural fruit of the spirit that is born of faith and is not dependent on our circumstances. It stems from 
the confidence and assurance that we have in Christ. When talking about faith, it is also important to understand what faith is not. And one thing faith is not is taking a risk. Well-meaning churches and preachers make statements like, faith is spelt. I think you know where I'm going. R-I-S-K. Well, I call bunkum on that. Because that is not how faith is spelled out in the Bible. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, we are told, faith is built on confidence and assurance in Christ. His finished work, his sovereignty and kingship. We tend to make faith about us when it is the object of our faith that matters. Faith is not us taking a risk on God. If anything, it is God taking a risk on us, for we are the fickle ones, not God, for he will never, never leave nor forsake us. Siu Feng reminded us of that last week. But us, even the best of us, may deny and betray, but not God. So equating faith with risk-taking speaks of a lack of understanding of who God is a lack of appreciation of the Almighty One, the omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent One that Lawrence reminded us of. Putting your faith in an all-knowing, everlasting, all-powerful God is as far from risk-taking as you can get. Doing the things that He calls us to do is also not risk-taking. It is being obedient. So Hebrews 11 is not a list of risk takers. No, they were people of faith, disciples whom God called by name. Maybe God took a risk on and they proved themselves to be worthy. And it is this group of witnesses that we are called it, and it is this group of witnesses who are found to be worthy to bear the name of the Most High, of Yahweh. This group of witnesses that are cheering us on. We are being cheered on by the saints, but it is not any one of them that we are called to focus on. No, not even on the best of them. Not even on Enoch. No, we are being cheered on by the saints, but we are called to fix our eyes on Jesus. And this is the second principle, if you like, of true discipleship. Jesus is the focus of a true disciple. Hebrews 12, 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. It is not the saints, the heroes of the faith that we are called to focus on. No, it is Jesus that we are called to fix our eyes on. You've probably heard it preached, God loves you just the way you are. There is nothing that you can do to make God love you less. Such thinking is unhelpful for discipleship at best. God's love for us as individuals, as his creation, should not be conflated for his approval of the sinful state that we were in or are in. The focus of discipleship is not God's love for us. Yes, he is abounding in love. The focus of discipleship is instead on our devotion to a loving God. Consider this. God loves you too much to leave you just the way you are. And that is why he sent Jesus. If God loved us just the way we were, which was in slavery to sin, he would not have bothered to send Jesus. Jesus came so that we who were once lost in sin, we who were once enemies of God, could be reconciled to him so that we might be clothed in righteousness. Our sins which were once as scarlet, now being washed by the blood of the Lamb, can be 
and we might be found as white as snow. We who were his enemies are now co-heirs of the glorious inheritance that is ours in Christ Jesus. It is Jesus that we are called to focus our eyes on, the author and finisher of our faith, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Jesus is our greatest encouragement, our supreme example, our greatest witness, if you like. For it is by the blood of Christ that we become a part of the body, and it is through his victory over sin and death that our eternal destiny is secured. And it is Jesus that we look to for direction and instruction as we seek to follow him as true disciples. What can we learn from Jesus about being a true disciple? When Jesus was here on earth, he was not God. He was fully man. But yet we are told he was without sin. Hebrews 4 verses 14 to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Jesus was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. How did he do it? One thing that we can be certain of is that Jesus did not do it through his humanness, in his own human strength. He did it through his communion with God and through the enabling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, all through his time on earth, de demonstrated a holy determination for regular communion with God. Above all else, Jesus valued time alone with God. The 17th century philosopher who was a Christian, Blaise Pascal, said this, all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. Solitude is a spiritual discipline. All through the Gospels, we see a rhythm to Jesus' spiritual discipline and his ministry. Times of prayer and solitude, times of communion alone with his Father, times of fasting followed by times of ministry, of teaching, healing, and restoration. If you read the Gospels, it's impossible to miss this rhythm. We can also observe the pivotal role of Scripture in the life of Jesus. Jesus did not have a personal copy of the Bible like we do. He heard and learned what was read aloud in the synagogues. But one thing we can be sure of, Jesus was utterly captivated by God's word and he did not hesitate to use its power to resist the evil one. Does the rhythm of your life, my life, include times for communion with God? Does it include times of solitude where it is just God and you? Does it include time for reading, meditating, and dwelling in his word? If it does not, why not? Fix your eyes on Jesus. He has showed us the way, but it's up to us if we will follow. To not follow is to our own peril. In addition to a spiritual discipline, Jesus was both empowered and enabled by the Spirit of God. And this was both foretold in the Old Testament in Isaiah 42 and was fulfilled in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 3. And in Acts chapter 10, you can see the apostle, read about the apostle Peter testifying to this in the home of Cornelius. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. How he went about doing good and healing all who are under the power of the devil because God was with him. Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and through the power of the Holy Spirit, he went about doing good. 
Communion with, communion with God in prayer and solitude, being equipped by the word of God, being empowered by the spirit of God is what allowed Jesus to be tempted in every way but still be without sin. It is what allowed him to do the Father's will, to fulfill his divine purpose. And the writer to the Hebrews is beseeching us to follow Christ's example here. Look at Jesus. The same spirit that was with Jesus is with each of us and in each of us today who follow Jesus. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he did not leave us as orphans. No, the spirit of Christ is a deposit in every believer to teach and to guide us into every good thing so that Christ may be glorified. I've had the privilege of being a part of this church for more than 20 years, 23 years. And one thing that I think we do well as a church is making everyone feel welcome. If you are a visitor here this morning or someone who's been attending our church for a few weeks, I hope you have felt welcome here. But one of the things over the years that as a church I feel that we have struggled with is welcoming the Holy Spirit. We have not always been fully open. We want some of the Spirit, but maybe not all of the Spirit. And why do I say that? Because we use terms like, but we are not Pentecostal, or we don't want to become too charismatic when it comes to the Holy Spirit. We want perhaps a dose of the gift of healing, perhaps a little bit of words of wisdom, a sprinkling of words of knowledge. But the prophetic and speaking in tongues, maybe not. Healing and miracles, we'll take them when we've exhausted all other options. Unless we learn to fully embrace the Spirit of God, and as the Apostle Paul said, unless we eagerly desire the spiritual gifts that God has graciously provisioned for us, we cannot and will not achieve the things of eternal consequence that God wants us to achieve. The only legacy we may leave behind will be our imprints on the pews of the church. Hebrews 12, 3, consider him, consider Jesus, when you're faced with temptation, trials, hardships, persecution, tribulation, consider Jesus. For there is nothing that you or I will be asked to endure for the sake and cause of Christ that is greater than what Christ has endured himself. So consider Jesus. Look to his example so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Don't give up. Finish the race win the price. Yes, this is a battle that we are in, not just against flesh and blood, but against the powers of darkness. So equip yourself and persevere until the very end. For victory is certain, but you must, I must, stay the course. In the army, the most shameful thing that a soldier can do is to give up and desert his comrades. If we do not fix our eyes on Jesus, we will give up. We will become weary and lose heart. The King James Version puts it this way. Consider him, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Be of strong mind. And the most amazing thing about following Jesus as his true disciple is that victory is certain. And a reward is in store. And this is the third Secret, if you like, of discipleship. Joy is the crown of a true disciple. Don't give up. Consider Jesus, for a crown of joy awaits you. Hebrews 12, 2. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Following Jesus as his true disciples, seeking to fulfill the divine purpose with which each of us have been called, spurring each other on as we seek to be salt and light 
Yes, there will be challenges. There will be opposition. But one thing is certain. If we fix our eyes on Jesus, we will not be overwhelmed. And nothing can overcome us. We are called to take up our cross in the knowledge that victory has already been won. We are called to run our race without giving up because victory is assured. Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame for the joy set before him. And what was that joy? It wasn't his you. It wasn't his me. Eternity in God's presence with you and me. It was for this joy that he left his rightful place in heaven, humbling himself to a cruel death on a cross to be struck, beaten, and spat on. It was for the joy of you and me that he was led like a lamb to the slaughter, for the joy of eternal communion with you and me in the presence of our heavenly Father. What is your joy? I think it's a critical question for us to consider as it goes to the heart of being a disciple of Christ. What is your joy? Is it to see another come into the kingdom of God? Is it to see the unreached peoples of the world reached? Is it to see the sinner saved? If your answer is yes, and I truly hope that it is, then the question for you to consider also is, what is the cost you're willing to pay? What sacrifice are you willing to make? What shame are you willing to bear? What persecution are you willing to endure? In the words of Charles Spurgeon, We owe all to Jesus crucified. What is your life, my brethren, but the cross? Whence comes the bread of your soul but from the cross? What is your joy but the cross? What is your delight? What is your heaven but the blessed one? Once crucified for you, whoever liveth to make intercession for you. Cling to the cross then. Put both arms around it. Hold to the crucified, never let him go. Come afresh to the cross at this moment and rest there now and forever. Then, with the power of God resting upon you, go forth and preach the cross. Tell out the story of the bleeding lamb. Repeat the wondrous tale, nothing else. Never mind how you do it. Only proclaim that Jesus died for sinner. Following Jesus is not an exercise in marking time until Jesus returns to take us home. No, it is an intentional pursuit of the cause of Christ. When Jesus called his first disciples, he called them with these words. He said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. There was intent, there was purpose, and it was completely missional. Do you have a burden for the lost, the unreached? Will you intercede for them as Christ intercedes for you? Do you want to see answers to prayers? Pray for the lost and the unreached. Come join the monthly fasting and prayer this Friday. Do you want to see answers to prayer? Try some unselfish prayers. Follow the example of Christ. Intercede for, the, for another. It will do you good. As we finish, if we remain faithful, if we run our race with perseverance, not in our own strength, but through the power of the resurrected Christ in us, a crown of joy awaits us. When your race is over, do you want to receive your crown? Do you want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant? Then be willing to sacrifice all to win another for Christ, to rescue another from the gates of hell. 
1 Thessalonians 2, 19, for what is our hope, our joy, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? This is the soul winner's crown, sharing your faith, praying for someone to encounter Christ, being burdened for the lost, leading someone to Christ, sending out evangelists and missionaries, supporting those that are in the mission field. All your labor and sacrifice for others to know Christ will not go in vain. It will be credited to you as a crown of rejoicing. Over the last five weeks, we've covered a lot of territory in our series. It is my prayer and hope that even as Si Fang, Aaron, and I have shared with you that God has spoken to you through us and perhaps even in spite of us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Let us run the race marked out for us with perseverance. Let us not grow weary and lose heart, for victory is certain, and a crown of rejoicing awaits. As we conclude our series, it is my earnest desire for each one of us that one day the words of Job chapter 1 would be true of each one of us. Job 1.8, Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Have you considered my servant Jenny? Have you considered my servant Ian? Have you considered my servant Elaine? There is no one on earth like them. They are blameless and upright. A man, a woman who fears God and shuns evil. Let's pray. Lord, to whom else shall we go? For you have the words of eternal life. We confess, Lord, that we have not always been faithful to the high calling that each one of us have received to be your disciples. We confess, Lord, that we have allowed the things of this world to dull our senses, weaken our resolve, and steal our focus. Our eyes have not always been fixed on you, Jesus. And we have not always run our race with intent and purpose. Our hearts have not always been burdened for the lost and the unreached, but instead been crowded by our own desires and dreams. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray. Teach us, renew us, transform us. Break us, mold us, and make us to be more like our Savior and our Lord, so that he may increase and we may decrease. Equip us, we, we, equip us, we pray, for every good work, so when our race is complete, our lips can repeat, yet not I but through Christ in me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.